Hello and welcome to this special edition of the Chronicles of Aguna brought to you by loserpool.com. I'm your host Harry Simiu and today I'm joined by a very very special guest. On the line <laughs> is Roman Molina, the author of Unai Emery El Maestro, the authorized biography. Roman, welcome to the show my friend. How are you? We're finding you and many thanks for the invitation. <laughs> We're very pleased to have you on board and and we'd love to talk to you this afternoon i'm really really looking forward to it uh everything okay yeah yeah definitely well for all the people we will listen to that i'm sorry if i'm making some mistakes with my english so my apologies in advance don't worry at all don't worry at all if i try to speak french it would be a, a absolute comedy. <laughs> so <laughs> it's probably best we go for the english <laughs> yeah, firstly definitely. firstly roman tell us yeah. how you ended up writing this fantastic book how did it come about and, and why did you pick unai emery Well, I don't know if it's fantastic, but thanks for the <laughs> for that. Well, it was uh, two years ago when he came to Paris. Uh, my French editor Bertrand Pirel asked me if I was interested to write about Unai. And uh, first, I was afraid because I thought a biography. I was afraid, you know, that I will repeat myself. I was very afraid of that. I believed writing a biography it's a tough exercise because. I don't want to make a Wikipedia things, you know. I want, in each book I made, I want that the people who will read it will learn something, you know. Yeah. So I fucked a lot. And the thing that really interests me was because of the career of Funai, so thanks to him, I can also write about the life in Spanish lower tiers, in second division, in third division, and also in Andalusia, my beauty Andalusia, where I'm currently living. So that's what really motivates me. Not Unai Emery, but the fact that he was a guy who built his playing career and he started also as a manager in the lower leagues, a massive fan of lower leagues, especially in the, the football league and the non league in England, also the Scottish football league. So that's really motivated me because that you know the kind of talent I like and I, I believed I could use Unai's journey also to talk about that. So that was my main motivation at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I mean, has Unai Emery had a look at this book and, and what was his feedback like? Well, when I accept the project, I talk about it uh, to his brother, yep. Igor, uh, which I know since a couple of months ago. And because I already made an interview with Unai during his time in Sevilla, to the training ground of Sevilla, which was quite... Quite a good interview and quite funny because the training ground in Sevilla is like a non league training ground. It's very, it's amazing, man. So I told him my, my project. And my project was I'm not the guy who will write the story to say, oh, Unai Emery is like this, like this, like this. Because I wasn't a player and I did not have Unai Emery as a manager, as a teammate. But what I can do is find people close to him and not that close to him, even people who are hard arguments with him mm -hmm. to tell about what they think to their memories everything it's deep kind of people who can tell the story so we talk about that i think he likes my my honesty and uh, well unai didn't read the book before no one of his family read it before publication but they accept to give interviews uh, for the project uh, even unai we had interviewed four times in my life now Okay. Uh, one in Sevilla, two times in Paris, and one in Arsenal. Uh, but he didn't want to read it. The only thing he told me, which I found it very funny, uh, he told me that he would like some critics, criticize, because with the critics, it could get better. So I thought, so this guy is seriously telling me, write whatever you want, but don't forget to criticize me. I, I believe it was. <laughs> uh, but, but it summarized also his personality, a guy who wants every time to get better and better. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, we spoke a little bit on Love Sport Radio the other night and you spoke yep. about his adaptability and the fact that he's happy to play different systems because I put a question to you saying, you know, I thought that he was going to come here and play one way and he's come and played a completely different way. So, you know, I, I've been taken a little bit aback by his adaptability. Now, you emphasized how much importance he places on his fullbacks. What did you can what what did you mean by that? Can you expand on that a little bit for our listeners that haven't heard that show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a guy. I mean, he used several systems in the past. For example, in, in Valencia, he used a three four three. Uh, in Sevilla, sometimes a four four two. So it's not 
mainly about the system. It's about the players you have. But there's two two key things. I mean, three key things in how we see the game. First, is an, is an attacking my manager. He, he loves to attack, especially in his first year as a manager. He was maybe a little bit crazy about that because it was too much. But one very important fact is the fullbacks. Why? Because all these fullbacks score a lot of goals and have a lot of assists. Why? Because he likes to give some freedom to the offensive players like the winger. So, for example, you play on the right wing, but you likes to go, you know, inside. If the fullbacks is going straight forward, the, the, def- the opponents can't lay the fullbacks alone. And also, because it gives you, you know, the possibility to attack all the spaces, not only the center, but also in the left, also in the right. Why? Because you could use some space created by that on the opponent's defenders. Yep. So that's why it's so important to him, because it opens the game. And also, you need balance after that. So is it the second fact. For example, the fullback, the right back, for example, Berlin, is coming straight forward. You, have, you need a guy who cover him. And each time it's about that, it's about the cover. So the centre-backs, the centre midfielder, especially Granit Xhaka and Lucas Torreira, but also sometimes the offensive midfielder. You could see sometimes that Lacazette is chasing uh, in the pressing. And he, the, all the players have to move in the good time, the good direction to cover everything. And the other key things about him is the set-pieces. He's very meticulous, very fond of set-pieces. I mean, not also corners and free kicks, but also throw-ins. To give you an anecdote, so his brother is now a manager. I mean, he, he has his license, and the thesis he wrote is about the throw-in. So okay. he, he made 50 pages about throw-ins, wow. you can imagine. <laughs> 50 yeah, pages yeah, yeah. I, I, I read it. It's <laughs> fascinating. Because it it's also explores, you know, what Stoke City did, but also what Marcelo Bielsa did, Pep Guardiola, and also what his brother tried to do in Paris, for example. Because he told me, we have 30 or 40 throw-ins in, during a game. So it's it's something we have to work on. I mean, for example, a defensive friend can be very dangerous sometimes, but an offensive friend can give you some some good opportunities. So you, you have to work on that. So it, it's a guy, you know, he likes to work everything, but the three facts are fullbacks, balance, set pieces. Wow, <laughs> interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. And I love hearing stuff like this because, you know, we we as football fans sometimes take for granted the details in the game, the little details, like you just mentioned, you know, 50 pages on throw-ins. I mean, a football fan wouldn't even think of that, but that is the level of detail that managers at the elite level have to go into to, to be successful. Now, you also mentioned to me the other night that Unai is very much interested in, in psychology, isn't he? Now, yeah. where did that interest originate or come from? And that's a good question. I mean, he's a guy, he's a curious guy. He's an intellectual guy. I mean, he's a little bit like some other managers. I mean, Guardiola is very clever. And I mean, Marcelo Bielsa is like a philosopher. And there's two people I say because I like, really likes what they're doing as a manager, especially Marcelo Bielsa. Um, the thing is, when he was a player, he was, as they say in Spanish, a cagón. Cagón means sometimes who shit himself. <laughs> to be <Okay>. honest, <laughs> when you have some pressure. Uh, so he didn't deal well with pressure because he was a good player. He wasn't like, you know, a Portuguese manager in Premier League who wasn't the, a really good player. Unai, as a, as a good career as a professional player in Spain, he wasn't the best, but he wasn't that bad. Yeah. But he had troubles with anxiety. So the thing which I found very interesting is the evolution of the human being. How a guy who afraid with the pressure can be so sure and full of confidence as a manager. So he makes a good work about himself because he knows his weakness. So he works a lot on the psychological aspect because of his weakness as a player. And as he is a, he's a man who loves to read. So he reads a lot, especially about how you can manage group, uh, psychological thing, biography, of, for example, you know, the, the people who climb Mount Everest, all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. He, he's, a, he's a really fanatic of books and especially psychological books. He, there was... He, during his time in Valencia, he published a book he co-written with a psychology guy naming Mentalidad Ganadora, which means winning mentality. And the thing is, it's not about winning, it's about how we can win. You know, so he loves that. He loves that point, definitely, because it also helps him uh, in his day-to-day basis with the players. I mean, 
If you're good in the psychological thing, you can understand which player needs this kind of uh, talk. You understand? For example, this player who needs some cuddles, some hugs. There's other player who needs to sometimes that you can be fierce with him. You know? Yep. There's other players that you have every time to say to them good things. So with Juan Carlos Carcedo, his assistant, each day they're talking about that, but how we can get out the best from him. So they, so they play like a good cop, bad cop sort of thing. Is that right? Sometimes. Yeah. But as friends, because Carcedo is someone who can tell lie. I think you're wrong there. So it's very important, I mean, for a manager to have his coaching staff saying, I think you're wrong there. Yeah. Not, not a coaching staff to say, oh, yes, yes, sir, to everything. But the coaching staff can have debates with the manager. Obviously, the manager has the final word. But in a way, it's like a democratic way. I, I heard everyone. I heard the players. I heard my coaching staff. After that, I will decide, but I heard what you have to say and why you say that. I have to understand why you think that option is the better. Absolutely. And I, th I think that was one of the problems that we had at Arsenal towards the end of Arsene Wenger's days in particular, because when he wasn't getting everything right as he did when he first came along, there was no challenge. And, and I think Arsene Wenger's stature prevented the likes of Steve Bold or whoever was his assistant to feel that they could challenge him because he was in control of everything. And so it's nice now to see that, you know, and We've seen clips of Carcedo coming out and, and directing the team in defensive uh, phases of play and Emery doing yep. it on the attacking. So he very much trusts Carcedo, doesn't he? And have they, oh, definitely. Have they been together fair. for a while? Have they been working uh, together for a long sorry? time? Have they been working together for a long time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they played in the same club, Leganes, when they were in the second division. So I get, give you an anecdote because Pablo Villa, the second assistant, was there too. Uh, so one day Real Madrid signed a player I don't remember the player and, but Unai and Carcelo are training they were professional footballers I mean but they were so excited so passionate about football that after the training they go to their car and uh, to the Real Madrid training world trying to hide behind the bushes <laughs> to see the training with the new player to learn every time because they were so passionate for example if they play the Saturday the Sunday they will watch a game I mean from La Liga second division third division so they started to know each other there, uh, sharing the same love, pure love about the beautiful game. And after that, they went to university together. And when Unai took the, the post at, at Lorca, Carcedo was already in coaching in Cadix, I think. Uh, so he couldn't go with him, but straight away in Almeria, Carcedo was his assistant directly. So it's more than 10 years ago that they're working together and they know each other since, I think, the, almost 20 years now. Wow. So and same it... for Pablo Villa, the second assistant. Pablo Villa is like the general, you know, very shy guy, very calm. But in a training pitch, man, oh, it's like, you know, he, he puts the beast mode. It's like Adebayo Kinfenwa was coming to a training pitch. <laughs> Kinfenwa. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I tell you, Pablo Villa, is he, when he's in training or the game, he activated beast mode. Trust me. And of the, of the pitch, you look at him and say, no, I can't believe it. No, that guy is too kind. <laughs> but in a training pit, it's like a general of army, full of intensity. Wow. It's, it's great to get this insight on these people, you know, because like I said, um, you know, I think that the, 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 the average English football fan, not everybody, but the average English football fan probably doesn't pay as much attention to the other European leagues as they should. And, and so to get this education um, around you know, our new coaching staff and our new leadership team is fantastic. So thank you for that. Now, in order to get um, a good understanding of the man, of Unai Emery, as you mentioned, you interviewed a variety of players, coaches who worked with Unai. Who were some of the people that you were able to talk to, some of the more high profile ones? And were they all complimentary of him or was there some negative stuff as well? And and what was it? Uh, the, the thing was surprised me, the time I made the book, uh, I mean, I didn't have a sponsor. I didn't have a big media with me. So I contacted them as a, you know, as a freelance way, uh, telling about my project and asking if they're interested to, to answer my question about the time with Funai. And uh, almost, almost everyone said yes. Almost everyone. Uh, David Villa said yes without any question. Juan Mata, Alvaro Negredo, Ever Banega. Uh, Koke was the captain of Sevilla. Uh, Adil Rami, who won the Champions League with uh, the champion, uh, the World Cup with France. Yep. 
So almost everyone agrees. I was very surprised that, for example, two people in Lorca, so his first club, say to me, no, I don't understand why. Uh, Valery Karpin, the, the guy we had very, he was in trouble with him at Spartak, didn't want, didn't answer. I, I had a couple who didn't want to answer, but uh, 95% wanted to. Even people who had an argument with, especially in Russia, like Dmitry Popov, the sporting director, he, he said we had any problems. Uh, the thing is, I wanted to interview also the people who not getting well with an eye. But this guy did not answer my message because sometimes, truth must be said, they was asshole. I'm sorry to say that, but uh, there was some kind of players, you know, very arrogant players, so they don't care about that. The thing is, is he, he had people who were saying, you can't say bad things about him. For example, when I had to actualize the book, I made interviews with people in Paris, uh, like people, like directors of the club and all this stuff. They were always saying good things about the human being. About the human being, it's very hard to say to find someone saying, well, oh, this guy is an asshole, this yeah. guy is dishonest, because he's not dishonest. If he has something to tell you, we take face-to-face straight away. But obviously, there's thing you can say, oh, maybe you can do better, everything about that. The thing is, I tried to make the most honest thing I could, uh, hurting to players, people who love him, people who maybe wasn't fond of him. For example, in Sevilla, there's a defender named Juan Canca, who I think he played a little bit for Cardiff also. And okay. He wasn't very close to Unai, but he wanted to answer. And he told me one very interesting thing. He told me in the dressing room, in the pre-talking, because when Unai came to Sevilla, it was very complicated. You know, For example, there was uh, Reyes, the former Arsenal player, yep. uh, was the captain with Sparic. So the two captains each ate each other. For example, the dressing room was, was a mess. So it was very complicated, mid-table situations. So Unai tried to, you know, during six months, his job wasn't to coaching, was to get the players smiling. So they made activities, you know, like uh, ping pong. I don't know if it's correct, you know, the, yeah, table, the game. We like, call it table tennis, but yeah, I know what you mean. Table <laughs> tennis, that's it. Uh, tennis, uh, walking to the beach, you know, that kind of stuff. Because he told me the dressing room was so sad that I couldn't work. I mean, the players couldn't work on that. So I had to... To, to wake their love for football, their love for making a sports team. And uh, so Kala told me in the pre-talking, Unai didn't make the pre-talking, he asked the player, so you, what do you think? Do you think uh, you can play like this, like that? that? At the beginning, there were players who were, didn't want to talk, and step by step, the, play, the, the players started to talk, and the pre-talking, maybe one hour, two hours, because all the teams tried to you know, build something. And Kala told me, man, I was afraid. Because I, I disagree with something, and I believed if I tell him, I, I won't play. He will punish me. Yeah. And after I say, ah oh, fuck, I, I say to him, and I say, so what do you think about that? And he spoke almost 50 minutes about it, and he was never punished, obviously. And when I told him, I liked what you did, because you are involved in the team, you're implicated. Because in your opinion, maybe you have to do this thing, and you. you so I tell you why. Because you had to give me the good arguments. Why you think that? So it's, you know, it's like a constructive discussion. Uh, so I think it's very interesting that his player, for example, Kala told me that kind of stuff because it can show everyone that he's a man uh, who listens to the other people. He's not a stubborn manager. Yep. And so it was very easy in a way because all the players almost wanted to talk. And sometimes it was one hour, two hours interviews, especially the guys in Almeria, Loka. Uh, even in Sevilla, in, in the three clubs, oh man, he was loved. Brilliant, brilliant. And you know, it's you know he would then went to PSG later on in his career, um, and it was well publicized that him and Thiago Silva didn't get on. Can you shed some light on on what happened there and why it was that the two just didn't weren't compatible? Well, basically, I, I will make one quote about Thiago Silva is former players and actual players of PSG and director of the club were telling me that great player, little man. Uh, I think he's one of the worst captain that you can have on your team because he's the captain of himself. He's so selfish. I mean, he's a guy sometimes he didn't agree with the manager. So he called the president to say, oh, I disagree with that. And the president, Nasser Khalifi, tell him, oh, make what you want. So <laughs> once Thiago Silva was... I don't know, maybe upset with the club, so the PSG bucked him a new house. That's how this club is ruled. Everything is about money. Yeah. Uh, Thiago Silva had a guy named Marcelo, 
Marcelo was uh, like a physio for Thiago Silva, but more like that. And sometimes Marcelo say to the coach, the former coach Laurent Blanc, well, Thiago Silva today didn't train. Okay, he didn't train. But Thiago Silva didn't do the same exercise as the other because he, he can't. But with Unai, you can't do that. You, you can be Thiago Silva or Neymar. In the physical preparation, you made the same. Obviously, if you have trouble with injury like that, you adapt the thing. But you're treated the same way. You can be a youngster or a top star because it's his, his way of seeing the thing. So with Thiago Silva, yeah, he had troubles, definitely. After the first season, Unai asked his board to get rid of Thiago Silva unless Thiago Silva accepts to change a little bit. By changing, is taking some risk because Thiago Silva is a marvelous player. He's so technical, he's so gifted with his foot. And Unai wanted him to take some risk, you know, with the first pass. Yep. To, to play a little bit higher, to play a little bit faster, that kind of stuff. And when you have your keeper who doesn't want and sit down, deep down on the, on the field, it's, it, it's terrible sometimes. But, man, when Unai came at PSG, Thiago Silva say, oh, it's marvelous now with the new manager. It wasn't that case with the, the former manager. And now that Unai is leaving, he said, oh, it's marvelous with the new manager. <laughs> You know, and with the other, it wasn't that case. Fuck, man. It's an hypocrite, definitely. And uh, really, fantastic player. But you can ask everyone in Paris. They will tell you the real Thiago Silva. The real Thiago Silva is not a guy you... It's, it's very complicated. Uh, so, yeah, he didn't get along with him. But uh, like Laurent Blanc before, so... Yeah, so it's obviously an issue with Thiago Silva, isn't it? Because it's happening all the time, isn't it? It's not, uh, it's not specific. And he to benched him, him against Real Madrid. He benched him on the most important game of the season. He benched his captain to put a 21 years old player, Presne Kimpembe. Yep. So that summarized everything. So it summarized that Unai didn't trust him. It, for example, if you're a general of during a war, you don't go with Thiago Silva as a soldier. <laughs> and uh, in Bernabeu. In Real Madrid, he had some specific instructions. Play higher. Uh, go for the win. Not waiting for them, you know, and waiting very deep on your, on your field. So, he, he believed that a youngster is better for the job. Yep. In that game, you could see that he's a manager who will die with his ideas. Because he benched, uh, you know, he didn't text on the group. Thiago Mota, Levin Kurzawa, and he puts Yuri Bershish at left back. He put Giovanni Lo Celso with Nat Betis, who's a good midfielder. A uh, young Argentine midfielder put him as a defensive midfielder, which wasn't his position, because he believed it was the best for the team and for how they will play against Madrid. And the worst, they made a good game. They made a good game with that. But Thiago Silva that day obviously was furious. I can understand that because, as I told you, he's a very professional player. He works a lot. He's an amazing player, but he's a little man. Yeah. No. He's a little bit. And I can find you almost from which I know 10 or 15 people in PSG will say that, not one or two. Yeah. That, that's, that's amazing. That, it's a guy hated by his teammates. It's amazing. Wow. Wow. <laughs> You'd never have no, thought it looking from the outside. I, mean, but, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. I, I don't care about, about that. If, for example, Neymar is, is loved by a lot of his teammates. If Neymar has something to tell you, he will tell you. Diego Silva, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, so it is the contrary of Petr Cech. So, for yeah. example, Petr Cech is a gentleman of the beautiful game. Thiago Silva is a mercenary of the beautiful game. That's yeah. it. Wow. Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. Now, um, you've spoken about how good Unai Emery is as a human being and how many people have complimented him and, and his compassion and stuff. Um, the likes of Eva Banega have been highly complimentary of him as a person, haven't they? What did Eva Banega tell you? Yeah, Banega told me that Unai is like his second father. Because Banega is... There are people who say he's mad, which is not entirely false. <laughs> uh, but he's a very really sensitive guy with a big heart. He's a big heart. You know, he's not selfish like uh, a captain of PSG, for example. Um, so Banega had trouble with Unai. Sometimes Unai had fire him from the training and Banega went under the shower crying. And after that, Unai, you know, going to his house, having a coffee, a barbecue, this kind of stuff. They had a really special relationship because he knows that Banega is a special player. He was the maestro. It was, he was the guy who, who helped the game to be better in Sevilla. He's, he played a little bit, little bit like Ozil. And he, when he was in a good day, he was unplayable. 
uh, and also because it's good human being, everybody got definitely is. You have a fond of Unai with the player with a big heart. They can be a little bit mad, but the players, you know, who had a big heart and a love for football, a pure love for the game, to play the game. Sometimes this kind of play, he went very well with them. But as I, as I said before, obviously Unai has weakness in his management, is everything, because he's only a human being, so he couldn't be perfect. But with that kind of players, he's the man who took the best off Everbanega, for example. Yeah. So what are some of the weaknesses that some of his former players and people that he's worked with identified? You know, there must have been a few uh, yeah. things that constantly came up, wasn't there? What, what would you say was a, the, the common weaknesses that, that people were bringing to your attention? Is that passionate with football that sometimes he can't understand if a footballer isn't interested by football. Not by watching other games, but by his own game in his team. So he's very exigent, you know. He wants the best from everyone. He, every, every time he wants his player gets better and better. If you're a lazy guy, you can't deal with him. If you're selfish, it will be also complicated. Because selfish in a way that, oh, I take my money, I don't care. You have to be implicated on the team. You can be sometimes selfish on the pitch, like Cavani, because he's a goal scorer. But you want that your team wins each day. And yeah. if you're not in that kind of mentality, it can be complicated. Especially with the players also who believe they're that good that they, they can't learn. Because he's a guy who, who likes to tell you one thing or two details huh? to get you better. That's why with Thiago Silva there was trouble. Because Thiago Silva believed, I don't have to learn anything. So with that kind of player, and there's a lot in the football, huh? And also, I would say, with the players who are very selfish on the pitch also. He, he gets the best of David Silva, Juan Mata, Balega, uh, the, these kind of players, you know. I mean, like number 10, number 8, you know, very technical player, good vision of playing. But maybe he didn't get the best of the, the pure skills players. So, I said one of his weaknesses is that the other weakness for some people, is that because he's treated, treated everyone the same way. It can be a youngster, an old guy, it's the same. Yeah. So sometimes it can make you some troubles because there are players who say, oh, fuck, I'm, he can't treat me like the, the other one. But if you think about Unai, it's like, as I told you, a guy who believe about meritocracy, democracy, about you have to earn what you have. I understand, you're a fantastic player, but I can't treat you like this and say to the youngster, no. For example, you're a youngster, so you're shit. No. Yeah. It's like everyone has to be treated equal. So sometimes it can also be complicated for, for some players with big egos. But in Paris, there were some troubles, but obviously it wasn't that bad. I mean, it wasn't that good, but it wasn't that bad. I mean, you can see at Paris now, they're only third in the group Champions League. So I think everyone can see that the problem wasn't the manager because it was the same with Laurent Blanc and the same with Carlo Ancelotti. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Interesting stuff, interesting stuff. And I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I, I can't even yeah, tell I you. I think Chaco Silva will love it also. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll send it to him. We'll tag him in it on social media and see if he uh, <laughs> if he gets a chance to listen. <laughs> um, Roman, just based on what I've seen so far from Unai Emery at Arsenal, yeah. um, I would say that Arsenal Football Club seems the perfect fit for Unai. But at the same time, it seems that he's the perfect fit for us too. Would you agree with that? Definitely. I think for him, it's a massive challenge. It is really, it's a fantastic club, Arsenal. I mean, I'm not English. Uh, I'm not an Arsenal fan, but I, I saw Arsenal, you know, as like a gentleman club, like a, a club with an history, a past. Well, obviously, I'm not a big fan of the owner uh, and about other things that happened, but it also happened in a lot of clubs, not only in Premier League, but also in modern football. But, I mean, you have to, with the legacy of Wenger, I'm pretty sure a guy like Jose Mourinho, for example, you can't have him at Arsenal because he's a guy who likes to make it his own way like there was nothing before him. Uh, and Arsenal, you can't do that. You have to respect a lot of things. You have also to respect that the club is currently changing with Raul Sanley and Sven Mislintat yep. now making the transfer, all this stuff. So Arsenal needed a head coach, not a manager like Arsenal. Also, yeah. made for a transfer. And Ula is a guy, I, t I, I told you, he's not... I have respect for Allardyce and Redknapp, huh? but he's not this kind of manager who also making the transfers, talking with agents like that. He's a guy like Marcelo Bielsa. 
is a guy who give who say to the other guys, I want these kind of players. I want, for example, a central defender, left footed, fast. I like this player, but it's enough. He won't talk about money. So I think in Arsenal, Arsenal needed that kind of person. And also, needed, yeah, I think there's a lot of great managers. Una is one of them. He's not the best, obviously, but he's a good manager. For the moment, the players are responding well. I mean, yesterday I saw the game against Sporting. Obviously, you made nil nil, but the player had the desire to win that game. Yep. So, uh, you could see that they're trying to, to work on what he's saying. You know, about, for example, one touch, you give the ball. You give the ball. One touch, you give the ball. That kind of stuff with the fullbacks, the call, everything. So for me, the player for the moment are building a team spirit and a togetherness. If they're building that, it's because they're responding well to the manager. So for the moment, for me, he's suited. And also for him, I can tell you that he really enjoy. He really enjoy. Not only him, but his coaching staff. Obviously, he likes his time in Paris. So definitely, it's a massive club with strange organization, but it's a massive club. <laughs> but it's... It's better for a manager to be to be at Arsenal than PSG, especially a manager who likes to coach. Because yeah. in Paris, it's more about managing egos than coaching. Because the championship in France is very low, yeah. so he loves to coach. So in Arsenal, definitely loves it. Definitely. Brilliant stuff. Roman, thank you so much for taking time you. out of your day. I know that you're very very busy, so I really really appreciate no, it. No, no, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> Do you want to let our listeners know where they can find your book, how they can get hold of it? And how they yeah, can definitely. follow you on social. So they can social. order it uh, by Amazon. Yep. And also uh, in Waterstones. So you can find a book on your on your bookshop. Yep. And also on the website of the editor. So it's talesfrom.com. Uh, you can find it. And I think there were signed copies I made. So for the people who want a signed copy, it's uh, directly on the website of the editor. But in Amazon, you can find it. And well, I, I hope that people will have the curiosity to, to learn more. Because, well... Uh, I really loved what I what I did. I was lucky enough to make that book, so definitely I love to share. So if people read it, just tell me what you think. The weakness, I'm like on Emery. <laughs> Criticize it. Say the good stuff, but also the bad stuff that the next one can get better. Fantastic, fantastic. And we look forward to speaking to you again, hopefully sometime. Uh, if you're up for it, you'll be welcome on the Chronicles anytime you want. Um, do you want to let our listeners know how they can follow you on social media as well? Because I think you've got a YouTube uh, well, channel. Haven't you? Yeah, my yeah. name is Roma Molina. Uh, so you can find me on Twitter, on Facebook, and on YouTube, where I have a YouTube channel. For the moment, I only make videos about uh, in France, uh, in French, but uh, hopefully soon in English. Especially the investigation I made about the dirty side of, of the football football world. You know, like uh, the kind of people who died, spies, all this stuff. It's a subject of my next book. We'll publish in France next week. So yeah. The people can find me on social media like this to my name, Roman Molina. Brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. Let me try let me try and say that properly. Roman Molina, is that right? Definitely. <laughs> that that's it. That's it. <laughs> there we go. Good stuff. And and hopefully we can catch up again very soon and, and make some YouTube videos together. Who knows? Who knows? No no problem. <laughs> with with pleasure. With pleasure. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thank you once again for your support. Whether you're watching us on the video or you're listening via the audio, we appreciate it all the same. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button and, and share it with your friends and anybody else who might be interested in getting some further insight into Unai Emery and his career before uh, before Arsenal. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC and we'll be back with you again in the very, very near future. Until then, bye-bye.